Hello, everyone. My name is Katrina Lashley. I'm program coordinator at the Anacostia Community Museum in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much for joining us for the power of passion. I hope you've been enjoying the symposium so far, and thank you for joining us for a conversation. Um, through the experiences of our guest speakers, we'll explore the various passions um, that guide their work. So in other words, we're hoping to have you meet our speakers, not only as professionals, but also as people, um, to explore the how and the why of their work, how their dedication to and belief in the field of preservation has shaped their contributions um, to these professional spaces, but also these community spaces, um, and why that all matters. So to give you a quick overview of um, today's session, I'm going to briefly introduce um, our guest speakers. We'll engage in conversation to get them a bit more. Um, we'll have the opportunity to hear more about their work in depth. And I'll ask a few follow-up questions um, to unpack the themes and principles of their work. And then we'll open it up to your questions. And please feel free as the conversation evolves to add your questions to the Q&A box um, as they occur to you. And we look forward to engaging you later on in the session. So let's jump right into it. I'd first like to introduce Ember Farber. Ember is Director of Advocacy at the American Alliance of Museums. In her position, Ember communicates with the Alliance's Advocate Network and the field of, about federal policy issues and advocacy opportunities through legislative and advocacy updates, calls to action, social media, the Alliance's multiple print and digital platforms, and live and online programs and presentations. She also maintains the Alliance's public advocacy materials, which are designed to mobilize and engage advocates at all experience levels. She works directly for museum advocates nationwide, the Alliance's affiliate, regional and state museum association partners, and promotes this legislative agenda with members of Congress and their staff through speaking engagements around the country. Her prior experience spans private and nonprofit sectors, having worked with Fortune 10 clients as a grassroots and public affairs consultant, National Growth Association, and several other nonprofits. She holds a master's degree in political management from George Washington University and bachelor's degrees in American government and English literature and composition from the University of Virginia. Since 2019, Catherine Malone France has served as a chief preservation officer of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. In this capacity, she leads the organization's programmatic work in field services, government relations, state and local policy, research, trainings, grant making, and the stewardship and interpretation of the National Trust portfolio of 28 historic sites. Throughout her almost 20 years in the for-profit and nonprofit sectors of historic preservation, Catherine has made a concerted effort to work across the field. Experiences include serving as the executive director of the Historic Hillsborough Commission in North Carolina and as the curator and deputy director at Decatur House, a National Trust historic site. From the experiences, she brings the ability to understand preservation issues from a variety of perspectives and to move initiatives forward in ways that are both creative and strategic. After returning to the National Trust in 2011 to serve as a, national, as a director of outreach, education and support, Catherine became the Senior Vice President for Historic Sites in 2014, notably as the first woman in the history of the National Trust to lead historic sites development. In this capacity, she collaborated with a variety of staff and stakeholders to make National Trust historic sites more culturally and financially sustainable. This work has ranged from telling the full histories of these properties through creative and inclusive programming, to implementing a new shared use operating model that combines commerce and interpretation to activate historic sites in new ways and attract broad audiences to them. Catherine is a graduate of Wolford College with a BA degree in history and has a master's in historic preservation from the College of Environment and Design at the University of Georgia. And Barry and Catherine, thanks so much uh, for joining us today. I want to jump straight into the conversation. Um, and so, you know, whenever you first meet someone, your first question is, you know, who is this person <laughs> and where are they from? So I want to start off by having you share a little bit about the communities and communities, plural is very intentional, the communities which kind of in which you were raised and which shaped you. Um, so, Emma, do you want to start us off talking about your various influences growing up? Sure, um, would be very happy to. Uh, first, I want to say how um, honored and um, excited I am to be included in today's program, uh, not just this session, but the program overall. The chance to listen in um, so far today, and it's, it's just been an amazing um, uh, space for information sharing and learning. So thank you for including me. And I especially want to um, share my appreciation for Katrina's inspired approach uh, to this uh, session. This kind of question that we're opening with always lands with me as an origin story uh, type question. We've heard that phrase um, once or twice earlier today. And I, I love this idea that each of us um, have an origin story and it's been really wonderful to get to hear some of these from the other speakers throughout um, today's program as well. So I think for me, there's there's no um, 
there's no escaping that my career in advocacy is a direct result of the communities. Uh, I, I so appreciate how you put that, um, that I was raised in and how they shaped me. As the daughter of someone who um, whose mother made her career in running various nonprofits in uh, what we call the DMV, the DC, Maryland, and Virginia um, area, spanning everything from um, homelessness to child care um, advocacy and services, um, and a father who was a career FTC economist with the Federal Trade Commission, surrounded by a diverse community of friends whose parents were also dedicated public servants and nonprofit workers. That really instilled in me a deep belief in public policy, um, public service, and the mission of the people, not just the organizations, but the people who are drawn to that kind of work. Um, if I'm being fully transparent, my additional education and participation in the uh, Reformed Jewish community also further instilled in me a deep sense that it's all of our responsibility to be speaking up for the persecuted, the marginalized, and the disenfranchised uh, among us across our societies. So, of course, it doesn't hurt that when I was uh, six days old in the dead of winter, which was January 18th, uh, the year I was born, on the way home from the George Washington University Hospital, the original hospital, which has since been torn down and rebuilt across the street uh, in Foggy Bottom, my parents stopped at the Lincoln Memorial, brought me inside and read Lincoln's second inaugural address and the Gettysburg Address to me to instill the values of democracy in me uh, at the start. It further sealed the deal when during my junior year high school civics class, we were assigned the task of rewriting in modern language uh, one of the Federalist papers. And I didn't realize until the day the assignment was due that I was the only one who in class who thought this was a really cool assignment. So I feel like uh, that kind of advocacy calling uh, came early to me. Catherine? Well, you know, I, I usually say to folks that I, I don't think I ever really had a chance to be anything but a preservationist. Um, my parents uh, were restoring a, a house that had been saved from demolition and moved um, when I was small. And so my very earliest memories are of that work going on, of that material side of, of preservation and of it as something that was about transformation and discovery um, and that was also something that was collaborative. Uh, there were all kinds of different people there all the time working on the house and yet you know everyone would have to get together to solve problems or everyone sat down to eat lunch together and so I think from the very beginning to me, preservation was something that was at the very heart of my life. It was, it was my house, <laughs> it was where I lived. Um, and it was something that was transformative, even in small ways, and something that was collaborative. Now, my parents also were the kind of people who took me to way too many house museums and historic sites, uh, culminating in a story that my mother loves to tell of me having a complete meltdown at like age seven and just repeatedly saying over and over again, um, I hate historic houses, I hate old furniture, <laughs> and I hate fancy restaurants. Um, and today, I, I like all of those things um, and, and certainly make a career out of at least two of them. So, um, so despite that, though, um, again, preservation was just a, um, not just an idea, but an action and a value that was part of my life from, from the very beginning. So one of the, um, the themes I heard um, talk, hear you talk about um, your communities growing up and what shaped you was this uh, emphasis on service, this emphasis on community and collaboration. And so I'm very curious in terms of the specifics of so how did you kind of take those themes, that, 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 those, that understanding of your place in the world and your role in terms of, I guess, engaging with others, and how did that lead to your professional path? So were there a specific moment, a mentor, an event or combination of all three that kind of put you on the path to this is my professional pathway and this is what I'll be doing for the rest of my life. Um, Catherine, you want to start off talking some about that? Sure. Well, I hope Ember will appreciate, particularly because my my what really made made preservation even more concrete 
um, for me was my first sort of advocacy action. <laughs> um, you know, I was a nerdy little kid and I loved nothing more than my town's public library, but it was in just like a, a storefront. I'm from a very small town and um, it was in just a, a storefront and um, we were getting a new post office. So we were having a new post office built in town. And that meant that our historic post office, which is right in the center of town, this beautiful uh, building up on a hill, that meant that our historic post office was, you know, the post office is going to be moving. And so my father, uh, who was on the library board, asked me what I thought about the idea of the library moving into the post office. And I said, well, that sounds great. <laughs> more room for books, more room for me. Um, and he said, well, if you like the idea, you can write a letter to your congressman and ask him if the federal government will give us the post office because our town would like to turn it into the library. And so I did. And in my, you know, eight-year-old mind, my letter made the difference. <laughs> my, my letter was what, um, what sparked that. But again, um, you know, it was a it was a huge community effort and a big community celebration when uh, the library and the post office opened. So for me, that was the beginning of this idea that okay, preservation wasn't something that just happened at home, but it was something that we could all do together as a community and something again that could make our community uh, better. And I'm happy to say that. Um, with two more very sympathetic uh, additions, that uh, post office is still my town's library. Ember, was there a moment, a person, a mentor experience that kind of um, put you in the on the pathway in terms of preservation as a career? Uh, so I think uh, well, it's a great um, story that uh, Catherine shared. It does warm my heart and um, <laughs> and excite uh, me thinking about um, Catherine as the young advocate. So uh, I have to say that that really does have an impact on me. Um, and I have a library advocacy story actually from growing up that's not much part of my work, but you know I grew up in one of the more diverse um, uh, ethnically, socially, economically uh, diverse parts of Fairfax County. And at a certain point, there was an interest in closing the smaller but beloved and well staffed uh, stocked and well staffed library, uh, you know, that was really closest to within sort of almost walking distance in the neighborhood of my high school and um, conflating it with a larger, newer library in another part of town that um, was a less diverse part of the county. And we got involved in, uh, you know, lobbying the county not to make that move. And instead that, you know, local hometown library, which is now very close to where I live, uh, was renovated. And it, and, you know, every time we drive past it, I point out to my husband, like the story behind that library. But, you know, for me, I appreciate how you, um, uh, you know, overall phrased uh, this, this topic and this question, Katrina, because I think it was a confluence, a, a cascade of those events, you know, um, and, getting through high school and uh, starting to have a sense of, you know, it, it bubbling up that um, what was my interest area and these things were speaking to me that weren't speaking so much to other people that were just class assignments or record, uh, you know, required, um, uh, required to graduate from Fairfax County schools. So, you know, I can say for me, I think a, as a culmination of these various events, my interest in government always naturally sort of uh, leaned more towards the advocacy side of things than the developing the public policy uh, side of things. And really this concept um, that I think started to develop in high school as I saw my response to the, these um, these things going uh, on around us and the things we were, the work we were asked to do was, um, you know, I was really struck by always the, the capacity of the people to influence the, the resulting public policy, uh, even more so than developing public policy itself, which I think it's, you know, we all, all, many of us often don't realize how much of those public policies at every level of government really, really affect our daily lives. So the resulting public policy is really important, but always what resonated with me was the idea of voice and uh, using our voice. And also as somebody who, um, as Catherine alluded to, this really rang true, true with me too, as somebody who grew up going to, you know, spending well planned the vacations on my parents' part, fitting in as many stops at as many museums and living history museums and presidential libraries and science sites and uh, all different types of, uh, you know, what we um, know and consider to be museums, which is a wide, wide breadth of uh, organizations and sites, um, right? But it really, um, that, that power of 
uh, voice really always resonated with me. And I was struck by the extent to which museums and seeing stories and seeing issues uh, and seeing history covered in museums really seemed like uh, a huge amplifier of those stories and of those people. And potentially, uh, right, as the places where the stories of the voiceless and the untold stories get, get told as well, which seemed like a really natural extension of the ad, kind of advocacy work I wanted to do to me. So always this idea of an education and exhibition-based approach to speaking truth to power, which I think I really just sort of cultivated growing up um, with this, uh, you know, with these experiences that I had really um, resonated with me as well, and the extent to which places where history happens then become museums or kind of the birthplace uh, birthplace of various movements. You know, I think about time I got to spend visiting the National Civil Rights Museum um, at the Lorraine Hotel or experiencing the Women of Juarez um, exhibit at the National Museum of Mexican Art at a time when I was reading those stories in the news and trying to figure out how to make the rest of my network care about the situation in Juarez and a group of us go to Chicago and that's an exhibit um, on display. So I always, um, you know, those things all came together as a sensibility that once I had enough career ex uh, work experience to be a little bit pickier about which causes I worked for and with that uh, getting to represent museums was always gonna be a goal of mine. And I would you know, watch the ads and at a certain point um, AAM put up a listing and, and there we are <laughs> some many, many years later. I think I was thinking about the way I posed the question to you um, too. In terms of, you know, there's not always one set pathway into your field or your career. So can we tease this out a little bit in terms of, was it you graduated from high school, you go off, you know, you, the parents drop you off and you wave it by. Was there a direct path to your current career? Or were there some, you know, meanderings a little bit or, you know, this opportunity, they'll come back. So was this really you know, from point A to point Z or was it A, B, C, one, two, three, four, back? And how do you think um, did that really help to enrich um, and then really, I would say, strengthen um, the skills that you now bring to your current roles? Well, I mean, I'll say that, you know, beyond saving my local post office, um, you know, I, I finished, uh, finished college and, um, you know, I had a history degree and I knew that I did not want to be an academic. Um, everyone in my family almost is an academic. So I was looking for a different profession. And, um, you know, I, I began to look at, at historic preservation programs, um, academic programs. And, and I am almost entirely the kind of preservationist that I am because I ended up at the College of Environment and Design at the University of Georgia, which is a long way to say that um, my professional training is rooted in landscapes. Um, you know, at, at the University of Georgia, the, the preservation program is in the School of Landscape Architecture. So from the very beginning for me, it was really about it was about landscapes more than, than buildings and, and landscapes first. Um, and so, you know, from the very beginning too, I think my understanding of historic places was about how they evolve and how they change and how preservation relates to that and works within that context. I think, not to pick on other approaches, but I think that, you know, it's, it's easier for us to talk ourselves into some idea that a building can be frozen in time but you can never think about a landscape that way. Um, landscapes are always dynamic. They are by their very nature dynamic. And so, um, you know, for me, that was the, the really important sort of shift in my thinking um, and one that has defined, I think, my career in terms of thinking of places, first in terms of landscapes and, and how dynamic and, evolving they are. And Ember, I was very struck by how it was like you were gaining multiple experiences and preparing yourself for what you knew would be your next big step into this field. So can you kind of talk about that a little bit more in terms of this preparation and various skills that you gained in your different experiences? 
Absolutely. Um, yeah, thank you for the follow up. I think some of it solidified from Ramana um, pull one thread from uh, the uh, earlier version of the question, like, which is when did this solidify? And to some extent, um, it was part of that. There was a moment in high school, junior and senior year, uh, where some of this really did solidify down an advocacy and lobbying path first, um, which is that about that time when we're rewriting the federal's papers, which was just so fun for me. Um, we also had a requirement at that time in Fairfax County that you had to complete some odd 40 hours, I think, of work uh, on a local political campaign. And I knew at heart it wasn't particularly interesting to me to work on. I understood the nuts and bolts of a campaign, but working on a campaign attached to basically advocating for one person to get into office wasn't as interesting to me. I was already realizing as advocating for causes. And I actually advocated the, with the county and my school to get permission to do 40 hours of uh, work with um, local nonprofits instead. And so that was sort of a, a codifying uh, moment for me. I don't know where that instinct came from, but I had that instinct and, and started down that path. And I knew that I had wanted to go to um, the University of Virginia. And at that time as well, part of uh, UVA's history is for many, many years, for a lot of its history, um, until a handful of years ago, you were only allowed to get majors in the original major uh, categories that the school started with, right? Which meant that I couldn't, and I say this to say, I, I couldn't choose advocacy or lobbying as a as a major, or even journalism. Even if you worked on the newspaper, which I did for you, you couldn't be a, a, a journalism major at that time. The choices were American government. And I um, and once I got wind that part of how the American Lit program works there was they started with the Federalist Papers and the founding documents as original some of the first original American works. Um, and that's when I put those two together. And pursuing that that way really then further solidified for me, I want to, what I was realizing going through that study is that a lot of people didn't realize how much of a voice we have in our government. And so advocating for that, rather than a particular candidate or policy, advocating for that first, for whatever reason, um, spoke to me. And then the thing I realized as I graduated and came back to DC, which just seemed natural at that time, if this is the work you wanted to do, was that um, there are a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of nonprofits, and uh, you know, thankfully, uh, several dedicated to the cultural work, but that those jobs don't turn over all that often. So the path to answer your question was that I took, uh, you know, I earlier on I took jobs with, uh, you know, in, in different areas of the nonprofit community with organizations that had them available, and often, to be quite honest about it, in some cases, were better funded. Um, were sort of more lush and flush than the cultural community can be because I knew that would give me access to sort of best practices mm -hmm. in that area. And uh, my parents wanted me to stay at UVA and get a degree in American government. And I lobbied them at the time and said, oh no, GW has this degree. And at this time it was one of a handful in the country. Now there's many more, but this degree that's a practicum, it's, it's practical advocacy and lobbying. So I lobbied <laughs> to get, uh, to come home and do that instead um, with their, their support and, and partial uh, funding was was part of their dog in that fight. Um, so I'm fortunate to have had that opportunity. But that then, you know, further shaped that I wanted to do the advocacy and lobbying work. So coming out of that program, I um, I took jobs with causes that I maybe believed in a little bit less because I do believe that all, you know, all of these causes have a right to be advocated for because it gave me access to a level of resources and and how they were managing databases and how they were doing the mass communications and all these things which were new at the time, like 17, 18 years ago. Um, so that was sort of my path. And I always knew museums seemed like this perfect intersection to me of um, the, the cultural and education work that I had grown up experiencing and was such a believer in and advocating for uh, you know a breadth of voices across society. So you know, so that first five years, I was just looking. I was building my experience and looking for a, a cultural sector job, and the job at AAM opened up. Is there um, a list of guiding principles, kind of I would say influenced by the why of this work or the passion for the work, that kind of have shaped um, the way you maneuver these professional and community spaces? So if you had a list of like say three or four, these are my you know these are my guiding rules or principles what would they be or what are and have they shifted and changed over time? Catherine? Well, I mean, I, you know, we're going to talk a little bit more in, in greater detail about these in our, our presentations, but I'll say at a high level, you know, again, that that sort of what first inspired me in, to be part of the preservation movement and, and um, 
got me involved in it remains, you know, what guides me in, in some ways. Um, that it is transformative and that preservation is dynamic um, and, and historic places are dynamic and the work of saving them and making sure that they are in service to their communities, that that work is collaborative. Um, and I'll, I'll say the other thing, you know, I, I'm, I grew up in a, a small town in Alabama and, and being from the South, I, I do think that one other piece of it for me was that there were places all over my daily landscape that told the stories of the civil rights movement, of, of slavery, of segregation, of injustice, of, of racially motivated violence. Those places were part of the everyday landscape of my world in many ways, and albeit, again, from a position of of considerable white privilege, but they were part of that, they were part of that landscape and, and race and place were so connected that I think that's the other piece that I haven't talked about in these previous questions is that, you know, for me also very early places were, they were primary sources that told the full story. Um, and that told those stories in powerful ways. Ember? Yeah, this is such a great question. Um, I think yeah, for me, my it's hard, it's hard to follow up Catherine and her powerful capturing, um, but I feel similar in a lot of ways. And I think, you know, absolutely for me, everything sort of from those early through high school and um, college experiences and work experiences did shape a kind of, uh, you know, three to five key principles that guide my approach to the work. And it's interesting, you asked if they change over time. And uh, that's really interesting and making me think because what I've seen is that in my last 15, 20 years of doing this work, what's happened is these key principles have solidified over time, uh, not changed over time. And it really comes down to, um, you know, that. A, that legislators and stakeholders don't know all that museums and, and cultural organizations and preservation organizations and collecting institutions and, uh, and, and all different types of sites do unless we tell them. We really can't assume that they get all of the vital and not just nice, but essential and critical ways that they are part of their communities and meeting the needs of their communities. Um, and then it's all of our job to advocate for museums and preservation and these fields that we believe so much in. So if I believe that, that, I think that therefore it's my job or my life's work to help provide the resources to empower you, whatever your role in the field is, to be an effective advocate. And, you know, really at the end of the day that we each have a voice and a story and that voice and that story um, matter. And I think, you know, this is how I talk about this, even I think of before we knew the title of this session. So it seems so um, fitting to me, but, you know, all of us. So to me, it boils down to each of us are advocates for these causes and our passion for our work is our advocacy superpower. Like, you know, get the training, get the experience, you know, go on visits with other people, use the tools that all of our organizations provide. But your, um, you know, I think people can find the, the process of advocacy intimidating. You think you have to be sort of some version of, of toned down and button up and uber professional. And I think, you know, big driving principle for me is that our passion is our superpower in this work and we don't need to tone it down. So now um, I'm gonna take a step back and turn um, the stage over to Catherine and to Ember, secondly, to um, talk a little bit more about how their guiding principles uh, manifest in basically the various um, projects and initiatives that they've led so far. So we'll start with Catherine. Great, thank you so much, Katrina. And we can start with my slides uh, now, but as I wait for those to come up, I'll just echo Ember again. Katrina, thank you so much for putting together uh, and framing this conversation in this session in the way that you did. It, I, I hope people are enjoying it, but as Ember and I've discussed, it's also really uh, thought provoking for, for us as panelists. So, so thank you again, Katrina, for that. So this it, title here may be a little bit of an overstatement, but, um, but not entirely, because what I wanna do today is talk about two projects. Um, that we'll talk about them briefly, but that really represent for me five core principles that, that guide my work and that fuel 
my passion for preservation. Next slide. So the first project I wanna talk about is the restoration of the Ridgely Rosenwald School uh, in Capitol Heights, Maryland, which you see here on the left. Now, as you may know, there were about 5,000 Rosenwald schools uh, built across the American South in the early 20th century, primarily for African-American students through a partnership between philanthropist Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington, who was then the president of the Tuskegee Institute. Today, only about 10 to 15 percent of those Rosenwald schools remain, but many of them have been restored and rehabilitated and put back into use as community resources. At the National Trust, we have been involved with Rosenwald schools for decades, really. And today, uh, as a part of our African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund, we have an endowment to support Rosenwald schools. We're also working with a coalition of partners to support the creation of a Rosenwald National Park. Next slide. So Ridgely Rosenwald School, though the project I wanna talk about, was built in 1927 in the Ridgely community, which is now a part of Capitol Heights, Maryland. It's just outside the District of Columbia. The school was built on two acres of land that was given to the Board of Education of Prince George's County by an African-American woman whose name was Mary Eliza Dyson Ridgely. It operated as a school until the 1950s, and then it became a school bus depot, ultimately. It was hidden behind a chain link fence. Uh, the building itself was heavily modified to serve as offices, and actually much of the original plot of land for Ridgely was preserved because it became parking for buses. All of this in what became a densely developed area. Next slide. By 2004, the property had been transferred to the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, and they began planning for a restoration of the property. Now, this work was supported by some very powerful women in preservation who I want to acknowledge, including a great preservationist and community activist, the late Mrs. Mildred Ridgely Gray. She was the daughter of Mary Eliza Dyson Ridgely, who had given that original plot of land. And the other important women in preservation in this are the Prince George's County Alumni Chapter of the Delta Sigma Theta sorority who played a key role with many of their members and leaders, but most particularly I wanna acknowledge Tiffany Williams Jennings. So one of the detours of my career is that I spent some time working as a senior project manager for a preservation contracting firm. I wanted to see how the material side of preservation uh, worked. And so I was honored uh, to serve as the senior project manager for the restoration of the Ridgely Rosenwald School uh, while I was working for a company called Oak Grove Restoration Company. Next slide. So as I look back across that project at Ridgely School, the first principle it demonstrates is this, and I touched on this earlier, that historic places are powerful primary sources that have the ability to tell us the full, true history of this country. The restored Ridgely School, of course, tells multiple and interlocking stories and truths of segregation and discrimination and systemic racism, but also of the strength and the perseverance to overcome those forces, of the Ridgely community's commitment to education, of the positive impacts of the partnership between Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington, and of the students and the teachers whose own stories connected to and grew from the Ridgely School. Now, you might get some of that from looking at a historic photograph like the one on the left. But when you visit Ridgely School today, you experience those truths in a way that is visceral and deeply meaningful. Next slide. The second principle of preservation, though, that Ridgely illustrates for me is that we have to approach historic places with humility precisely because they are holding those powerful stories and truths. But we also have to honor those stories and truths by having a vision for what they can be, how they can continue to serve their communities and carry their legacies forward. At Ridgely, this humility was critically important from the very beginning from a material standpoint. 
the building had been modified, but by listening to the building, by treating it very carefully, we were able to bring back the Ridgely School in its original form. We removed the drop ceilings to reveal the beautiful windows that are known as a hallmark of Rosenwald schools. We pulled away the wood paneling to reveal the ghost marks. You see some of them here of chalkboards and bulletin boards, stoves that were used for heating. Even as we started to remove the concrete front stairs at the entrance, we discovered that the original concrete stairs were there just underneath them. Next slide. We discovered two original light globes in a crawl space and in the back of a supply closet, I'll never forget this moment, which turned out to have been the original cloakroom, a tiny detail had survived, hooks for coats or lunch pails, an echo from the past that became so evocative when it was carefully restored. You know, humility with historic places though is about more than just the care with which we might approach a structure. It is for me a broader principle of how we have to approach all of our work, acknowledging the truths of the present, including what has been covered over and what has been neglected, and then carefully, honestly, and sensitively excavating the past together. Next slide. But that humility has to be coupled with an aspirational new vision for a historic place. And that was certainly the case at Ridgely School. Today, it's owned by the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission as part of their Black History Program. The Deltas continue to provide tours and school programs, their exhibits and lectures and community events. It's also a gathering place. And once again, the Ridgely School is serving and strengthening its community. They've cl been closed during the pandemic. They've done some um, virtual programming, but they're gonna be reopening soon. And there's a link in the, in the chat. Um, I urge you to visit the Ridgely School. Next slide. So the first two principles that Ridgely School demonstrate really feed into this third one, which is so important. The idea that how we designate and restore and revere and activate and interpret historic places is a tangible and powerful way of advancing justice and equity. That work can be transformative. Next slide. Truly, dramatically transformative, just like the restoration of this classroom, and not just for a single building like the Ridgely School, but for individuals, for entire communities, and for our country. Next slide. So the second project and two more principles will go all the way across the country to Monterey, California. Monterey was founded in 1770 in an area that was home to the Ohlone people. And then Monterey itself served as the capital of the sprawling Alta California province under both Spanish and Mexican rule until it became a part of the United States in 1846. And right in the heart of Monterey's commercial district, Cooper Malera Adobe grew to include two residences, two commercial buildings and two redwood barns built on a two and a half acre site beginning in the 1830s and owned primarily by the Cooper Malera family until the 1970s. Next slide. In the early night, <coughs> excuse me. In the early 1970s, the property was given to the National Trust and our partners at California State Parks restored it and they operate it pretty much as a traditional house museum and historic site. But due to budget cuts, by 2011, the property was largely closed to the public and really disconnected from the revitalizing downtown around it. Next slide. Since it was a National Trust historic site, we decided to take this opportunity to develop a new model at Cooper Malera. And the experience of managing this project helped me refine the two other principles of my work I wanna highlight. The first of which you see here, preservation is activation. And that took many forms at Cooper Malera. Next slide. As we reactivated the museum spaces there, we took the opportunity to focus on things, making things as dynamic and inclusive as possible. Today, there is no admission. You can sit on the furniture, you can hang out and play chess in the parlor, very different from a static museum space that you see on the far left. 
They're changing bilingual exhibits throughout. You can wander around with your coffee or your groceries, take pictures, play the piano, and the community loves it. Next slide. Places that had been filled with static collections became, have become vibrant gathering places, activated with local history and art exhibits. Next slide. We also activated new parts of the site's history itself, shifting from an interpretation that had been focused almost entirely on one white man who built the first house on the property to include the women who lived on the site for far longer than he did and the richness of its Latino heritage. These are women like Encarnacion de Vallejo Cooper, who was the first, who was, who was from uh, one of the most prominent and powerful families in Mexico. She became the property owner in 1852 and owned it for almost longer than anyone else. Here she is featured as part of our campaign for where women made history. Uh, she's the letter E. And uh, Luisa Diaz, who you see on the right, who was the longest resident of the property, where she lived for more than 60 years and ran a dry goods store. Next slide. And we also activated the landscape in new ways. During the pandemic, the museum spaces have been closed, but we've been able to keep the grounds active and open, and they've really served as a place of respite and beauty for the community. Next slide. But truly activating Cooper Malera wasn't something we could do all by ourselves. We needed partners and we needed partners that were from way outside our usual uh, group of partners, developers and commercial business owners. Um, we needed them to return commerce to the site, to create new revenue streams and to make it part of the fabric of people's lives. Preservation truly is better with partners. And ours at Cooper Malera show this every single day. Today, Alta Bakery operates in a building on the site that was home to the Pioneer Bakery, Monterey's first commercial bakery in the late 19th century. And every day, surviving throughout the pandemic, there's almost every day a line out the door to Alta Bakery. Next slide. Written into our leases with our commercial partners is the requirement that we all collaborate to tell the stories of the site's history. And Alta Bakery does this brilliantly. Their name, of course, references the Mexican province of which Monterey was the capital. While they're standing in that line out the door, customers learn about the history of the Pioneer Bakery through historic photographs and exhibits. There are special pizzas named after figures in the site's history. And as you see in the image here, the Cooper family cattle brands from our collection hang on the wall. And that brand is dusted onto every loaf of bread and it's even their latte art. Next slide. Another partner has activated the site's distinctive redwood barns as an event center called the Barns at Cooper Malera. Next slide. And in the barns and all over the site, Spaces have gone from vacant to vibrant. We couldn't have done this activation by ourselves. Next slide. So there are my two projects and my uh, five principles. And they, call, they all come together in a sixth principle that, that I do wanna emphasize because it really is at the core of what inspires my passion uh, for this work every day. The idea that preservation is not really about the past. Preservation is about the better future we're building together. So thank you so much. And with that, I'll turn it over to Ember. Thank you so much, Catherine. It's wonderful to get uh, so much more insight into your into your work right from uh, you know from from your voice. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen. So bear with me one second while I get that up. Okay. Um, so I appreciate the chance to dig into this um, connection between our, our why and the passion for the work and what it looks like a little bit um, more. And you'll hear me double down a little bit on some of the principles that I uh, mentioned a bit earlier and uh, fold in a, a couple um, more or a couple of examples. Um, it's, you know, really exceedingly clear to me 
that the why shapes and informs the way I do this work of advocating for museums and that those principles we mentioned earlier really do guide my approach to the work um, every day. Namely that I believe that advocating for museums and preservation and history and science and education and the work that we do is all of our jobs, whatever our current role in our fields or our organizations or between things right now um, might be. And it's so, part of that comes from that it's so incredibly clear to me, no matter how many years I've done this work, that our various public and community and elected stakeholders um, really absolutely do not know the full breadth of what museums and, and other organizations, cultural organizations are and do in their communities unless we take it upon ourselves to tell that story early and often. So I'm not gonna go through these um, slides in detail today, but I wanted to pull them up because these are the slides I would uh, rely on or walk through if I was giving my kind of um, go to advocacy and advocating for museums um, presentation or talk. And I want to skim through them here just to impart the extent to which um, it really reinforces my whole approach to this work that is based in that belief that it's all of our jobs to advocate for these fields that we not only believe in, but want to make uh, our livelihoods in, right? And that is dependent on them being sustaining, uh, thriving fields. And so I really take seriously that it's um, that it's my job and, and an important part of the work that the Alliance uh, does to give you those uh, tools to be an empowered uh, advocate for museums and, and the work that you do. We believe that effective advocacy is a career long um, leadership skill and a useful lifelong skill, whatever uh, direction uh, things take, and where we expect you to build and, and use that skill to advocate for uh, museums and preservations as causes. We take seriously that role in providing powerful resources to help you do that work. So there's the parts um, that AAM does to represent museums day in, day out, and then there's all the information and resources that, um, that we provide you to help you be uh, an empowered and an effective advocate. Uh, for for your work. And I just want to note here, you know, there's been some really good and interesting conversation throughout the day today around these terms, um, advocate, activism, uh, and, the, and, and the ways they can mean different things at different times, the way they, they can be used um, for or, or against people's work. And I, you know, want to say that it's really my mission in doing this work, not just that we're all advocates for these causes we believe in, but that we're effective advocates. And, you know, I want to reinforce that I don't think you have to be an advocacy expert to um, uh, effectively advocate for museums or preservation or whatever your piece of the work is, but you can be an informed advocate. And if you make yourself a more informed um, advocate, then you'll be a more effective advocate. And that, uh, you know, goes even farther in um, in moving the ball forward on this work that we're all trying to do. And so part of that being an informed and an effective advocate is understanding all the different kinds of um, policy areas and uh, funding and regulation and um, federal agencies, uh, different ways that museums are impacted by um, the public realm and, and the ways that the work um, that, that goes on in the public sector really does affect what museums are and do in their communities. And it's not just about funding uh, from a few different sources. I would reinforce um, again that we're not doing this work alone and we can do it together as a, a field, uh, that your passion really is um, your superpower here. So not to be shy when making the case for your work to legislators and other stakeholders. And you know, this particular time, I know that a lot of um, people are in different spots in the field uh, than they were a year ago. And I heard, I've heard, i heard, you know, over the many months and in the course of preparing for Museums Advocacy Day earlier this year, uh, you know, this question of if I don't have the job I used to have, or I'm not working full time with a uh, single particular institution, does my voice still matter? And I, you know, want to be here to say that's absolutely then the story that you have to tell right now, and that your voice does matter um, as much as ever. And, you know, my experience is that, um, whatever successes we have as a, a field moving forward um, and in the recent years have been and will be a direct impact of our collective field-wide advocacy efforts. And some of the ways that I see this, um, uh, see these principles come, come to fruition is 
uh, you know, for example, when we think about um, Museums Advocacy Day, whether it be in person or virtual meetings that we did with legislators, the rate and uh, number or extent to which legislators themselves want to join these visits with um, their museum advocates, or the rate and extent to which uh, members of Congress, state legislators, and their staff want to put museum um, and cultural stops on their uh, agenda for their uh, in-district work periods and visit these organizations and institutions that they represent. Um, you know, doing this work this way is what um, helps legislators and stakeholders understand that museums are history and science and children's museums and botanic gardens and railway museums and African-American museums and, and the whole, uh, you know, breadth and range of collecting and non-collecting institutions that are so uh, very essential to our communities. You know, as we say, advocacy really is everyone's job. And when we speak with one unified voice, uh, we're that much more powerful. Uh, just a snapshot of um, the variety of materials that AM and resources that AM provides to um, everyone to be an advocate for museums. And again, you know, doubling down on this sense that it's all of our responsibility to advocate. Um, we take seriously making these information, these resources and this information available to you. Uh, I also, you know, another principle that I would speak to is the sense of, you know, again, do you have to be an advocacy expert to participate, um, you know, and, and which advocacy activities make a difference? And it's it's so um, fitting and prescient that Catherine shared uh, the story she did earlier about writing, uh, writing that letter uh, on behalf of her um, her local library, because, you know, I, I think it really speaks to this sense of you don't have to have done a lot of advocacy to start advocate uh, advocating today. And every advocacy activity really does um, help us in that effort of, of building long term relationships with uh, our stakeholders who we want to be our supporters in, in good times and in bad. Right. So do what you can where you are with what you have. And our resources are designed to have a lot of um, a lot of different in, uh, entry points and different kinds and types of information and activities and ways that you can advocate for museums. And again, that stems from our sense that uh, there's a that everybody has a voice in this advocacy work. There's a role for everybody in doing this advocacy work, whatever your uh, current role in the field uh, is. So I see that we are getting some um, questions in chat as well. So I might. Um, Rather than go into deep detail, I might keep it um, brief and and there so that we can keep working through questions that uh, Katrina and um, the audience have. And I you have some thoughts on advocate um, uh, fatigue and what it takes uh, to keep this work up. And I hope we might come back to that a little bit later on. Great. Thank you so much, um, Ember and Catherine, for distilling the why of your work. And hopefully um, our audience or attendees um, saw themselves reflected in your principles. I'm curious, I want to explore, um, you know, what happens when, you know, your principles meet the practicalities of doing the work. And so, you know, as professionals, you're charged with carrying out the missions of your organizations, you're charged with fulfilling your, your, your daily duties, um, you're collaborating with a multitude of stakeholders who bring their own definitions of advocacy, you know, preservation into these various spaces. They have uh, multiple goals, intentions, and they don't always, you know, <laughs> it was always on the same page. So, you know, what happens when you have these beautiful, strong, powerful guiding principles that shape the way you, the way you would like to work in these spaces, and yet the realities of the day-to-day -day of partnerships, right? And partnership is an ongoing relationship. Um, it can be fraught. It can be challenging. And so how do you kind of balance and negotiate this idea of your guiding principles meeting the practicalities of doing the work? Maybe some specific examples and how do you kind of make sure that everyone walks away from the space you know that they've been heard respected and that whatever has been created is something that everyone um, feels that they, they played a really important role in and this is really um, a tool and an asset for the various communities. So um, Catherine, do you want to start us off? Sure, well that's that's beautifully said Katrina and um, you know I, I guess part of it for me and well, first of all, is that I do appreciate that people have really strong feelings about preservation and about historic sites and what they mean to them. <laughs> and and, and I, I think that personal investment in places is part of their power and part of what's great about preservation. So I, I try to keep that um, in mind always. 
Um, and then, I mean, as you said earlier too, in your, in your question, this, you know, I, I think that listening and hearing um, other perspectives uh, respectfully, but also, you know, meaningfully, I mean, really listening to them and taking them to heart um, is just, is a required part of this work. But I mean, I, I will say that, yes, I mean, sort of, you know, going from principle to practicalities can be, can be challenging, but I also, I mean, I celebrate those practicalities, right? I like being in the work. I like talking to people and hearing what places mean for, to them and what their visions are. And that's not to say that sometimes those conversations aren't difficult or charged. Um, but to me, the practicalities of the work are how we get to the transformative outcome, right? And so that's, that's the part of the work I love. Ember, how do you negotiate in terms yeah, of working no, with I, the various, <laughs> so you're working, you know, <laughs> working with various government officials, their staff, and then the communities and organizations nationwide. So, you know, you, you have these guiding lights that, you know, are really the passion that brought you to the field, but then you have to do your job. So how do you negotiate and navigate those spaces, those conversations? Yeah, I, uh, I agree with Catherine. Uh, this is a really wonderful question to dig into. And I also appreciate um, uh, very much Catherine's response to it. I think that I want to start by saying I agree. I think that, uh, you know, the, the, the process is part of the process um, to, to, for, to be circular for a moment. But that process, I mean, that, that most of the time, uh, you know, if not quite all the time, uh, very much, you know, hearing all the different voices, working through the different considerations, you result in a better place, right? A better ask, a better position, a better view of the work, uh, a better, um, you know, a more fully um, thought out needs assessment, whatever the sort of, uh, you know, uh, task at hand. So I would really agree with uh, that. And I appreciate that setup, that that's, that's part of the work that we should um, embrace and enjoy. I also think about the question as you um, phrased it, Katrina, a little bit in terms of how that applies to the work that you're doing in coalition versus when you're advocating individually. And there's, you know, some overlap um, and maybe some differences, but I, I think, uh, you know, another guiding principle in that regard that comes to mind is this concept of both as organizations working with each other and as individuals thinking about how you're gonna approach advocating for a cause or advocating with your elected officials. You don't have to agree with everything that everyone else says or does or believes in or is fighting for to start with the yeses. Start with the things that you do agree on and say, okay, in our coalition work, in this advocacy meeting, and you know, it, dealing with an individual legislator, I really don't agree with where they are on uh, other issues. But for the sake of the museum and preservation advocacy, there are potential uh, uh, supporter <laughs> until they're not, if they're not already a supporter, and I'm going to cultivate, um, you know, the conversation about that. Yeah. So, you know, I think that can be really um, powerful and clear the air and uh, give you some good ground to start on right away. This, you don't have to take issue with what you don't agree with to start with what you do agree with. And I think, again, I think that applies org to org and um, person um, to person. I would also say, I think another way, um, you know, through that is this, going back to this principle of we're not doing it alone and relying on, you know, there's such a breadth of organizations um, and we've heard from so many of them today and it's sort of just the tip of the iceberg, right? But but both, um, you know, museums and institutions and, and nonprofit organizations doing this work and putting out, you know, um, templates and data and resources and talking points and um, all different kinds of advocacy materials that you can start with, I think, to sort of, um, uh, help break that break down that well where do we go from here or what do I say first or what do, what do I say next and I think the other thing I would you know reinforce is that um, you don't have to agree with people to have a right to be heard by them you know I'm um, keeping in mind constituency and the fact that your legislators and their staff um, need and want to hear from everybody they represent. And it doesn't mean that your one letter is going to influence every vote, but it also doesn't mean that your letter doesn't matter. You know, if we're not going on record for the things that that we believe in and we've dedicated our lives to these work to this work, um, then then who would be? So I think I double down on some of the um, principles that way. And I, and, and I think there's a lot to this, uh, you know, start with the yeses and it doesn't have to be 
It doesn't have to be everything. And you have a right to make your case, even if you believe to that point um, a particular funder or office hasn't uh, been with us before. You know, if we stop speaking up, they're not going to know that we still care and we're still watching. So I mentioned before hoping that your principles would resonate with the audience. They'd see them, you know, see your principles reflecting in their work. Let's go beyond the professional field to different publics that we serve or we should be serving or ho are hoping to collaborate with. Um, how do you translate that passion? How do you kind of present your principles to the larger public spaces? Um, is it the idea that some of your principles have kind of been, I would say, influenced by working with community groups or various organizations? Or you know, how do you have get people excited about this idea of these spaces, these places that show us who we are? Um, and teach us the truth about us as a country and that you, the power of activating these spaces and imagining what these spaces can be and the role they can play in communities. And then, you know, having everyone saying, yes, I'm on board, I'm willing to advocate for these sites, these spaces, these narratives. And so what are some ways that professionals can really kind of go out and say, you know, these are the principles that guide my work. Do, do they make you buzz? Do they, do they excite you? And, you know, and if, you, if you're really excited about this project, you know, guess how much all the other work is being done across the nation. So how do we get the public excited and kind of um, on board in terms of the principles or the way that, that you work? Emma, do you want to start on the side and then we'll- Sure, I can yeah. jump in here. This is another really good question. Um, and I think, and I don't know that this is what you intend, but I hear this a little bit in terms of advocate and advocacy fatigue, right? And I, one of the examples that comes to mind from my own work is, I think that, you know, you'd be amazed. I'm continually amazed by how much of the time I'm working on something, uh, you know, some current, timely, relevant update, call to action, something, and I go to save it in one of our platforms, and I'm reminded that almost exactly, either to the day or to the week, um, the year before, and the year before that, and the year before that, we may have been working on seemingly the same thing. And right, to me, that come, becomes kind of the classic example. And in the, in the face of that, a few things keep me going. One is a deep understanding that the status quo is not a given, right? So as much as we would like to see more funding for museums and preservation and related programs and other favorable policies beyond funding um, grow and come to us easily, if we understand and respect the process, which is, you know, again, another one of my uh, principles, I think, in approaching this work, we recognize that by design, policy change was not intended to happen quickly. Right, um, and so we have to live with that and work within that reality. And in a world where everyone is on information overload, including legislators and staff, and all levels of public resources are virtually stretched to capacity, right, particularly at this moment in time, we can't assume that the funds and causes that we believe in will auto automatically maintain any existing support or funding they currently have. So through that lens, I, I come back to that and I'm reminded um, how important it is to keep advocating for what we believe in, even if it seems a little bit rote, even if um, improvement or progress isn't happening as quickly as we would like, because I see it that maintaining current levels of support in this environment is a win in and of itself. So remembering that. Um, helps me a little bit to, to slog through those practicalities. The other thing that I am personally continually inspired and energized by is the many, many people across many causes who whose incredible work and legacies of advocacy and activism precede us, right? And that stays with me top of mind. Just one example I'll share is uh, that's been especially present, present with me for many years, but especially over the last um, handful of years. Um, is the example of the indelible former Congressman John Lewis, right? And, you know, he said so many powerful things about uh, that. I don't think it was his intent to speak to this, but this is in hindsight what they end up doing, right? About keeping going, the keeping going and the sticking with it. And, you know, uh, one of them is if you don't do everything you can to change things, then they will remain the same. You only pass this way once, you've got to give it all you have. And I think I look at his, you know, his history and the things that he fought for and literally gave his blood, sweat and tears to move the ball forward on things. And even at the, towards the end of his life, this is so heartrending to me, right? When some of those very things were being 
broken down in horrifying ways, he still didn't lose hope and he still didn't lose energy to, to do this work of advocating for the public policy that he believed in. So I, you know, I go back to some of those um, sort of goalposts that if we're not speaking up, who will? And, and if other people could maintain hope in the face of adversity, then certainly we, we can and, and we must. So I hope that gets, uh, that gets at your question. Catherine, how do we, um, our various publics that we serve, how do we kind of transfer or share that passion? Sure. Well, first, I'll take the opportunity first to note that the late Congressman Lewis uh, attended a Rosenwald School. Um, so is, is part of that uh, tremendous legacy. And I'll also say, and I said this to Ember the other day, that I love listening to Ember talk in the same way that I love listening to our brilliant government relations uh, team at the National Trust talk because it's like civics come to life. Um, it's like your civics class in eighth grade come to life. And, and so I really, I appreciate uh, that always. Um, I, I do think just a couple of things to, you know, to echo from Ember, but, but thinking about, I always think about all the preservationists who came before us and all the people who've been fighting for these places for so long. And, and you saw a great example in, in my presentation of, um, about Mrs. Mildred Ridgely Gray, who was fighting for um, the Ridgely community and the Ridgely school and the Ridgely church and her own home and its stories for decades um, and just powerful, powerful advocates like that. Many of them women, uh, because of course, preservation is a a movement largely built and nurtured by women, which I, I do think is, is notable, but at the same time also being inspired by the work of so many people working on preservation around the country, um, state and local organizations and individual advocates, all people who have just a passion for maybe an individual place, but also a passion for this larger idea of preservation. And we're moving things forward little by little and sometimes in giant steps forward, but with, with just tremendous perseverance every single day. And then I'll just say lastly that, you know, I always come back to the idea that for me, preservation is inherently hopeful work. Um, it's inherently hopeful because first of all, it assumes there's a future. <laughs> it assumes that there is a future for which we are, are saving these places. Um, but it's also, I think, inherently hopeful because it is about restoration and rediscovery and reactivation um, and rehabilitation in ways that are, you know, intellectual and they're about memory and identity um, and continuity, but they're also about the tangible material makeup of the world around us. And I think preservation brings, brings hope into all of those things. And so that, that is what keeps me going, but I think it's also what binds together so much preservation work all around the country. Thank you. So we have um, some questions um, from okay. our audience. So let's start. Um, so from Megan, both of you are so inspiring the way you talk about preservation. Do you have a specific project that you are particularly passionate about or one that holds a special place in your heart? Let's say I go first. Uh, I'll, I'll jump in. I'll do a, um, I'll, I, it's like saying what my favorite historic site is. That's dangerous business um, <laughs> with lots of projects at the National Trust and all over the country. But um, I'll offer a seasonal example because I was there today, um, which is our Tidal Basin Ideas Lab. We're working on a project sponsored by American Express and in partnership with the Trust for the National Mall and the National Park Service to bring attention to the fact that the tidal basin here in Washington, D.C. is threatened, its infrastructure is crumbling, um, it's dealing with the impacts of rising tides and, and other things. And we brought together these five uh, world-class landscape architecture firms to um, imagine what the tidal basin, how we can save the tidal basin and, and what it could look like. And they are 
innovative and fantastic um, proposals that really highlight that preservation, again, is not about trying to freeze something in time, but it's about knowing that places will change and they need to change. And preservation is about how we bring good thinking to that, um, to save a, a place that matters to all of us. And um, Brooke. So I'll take a bit of a project uh, based answer rather than a place based answer. Um, and. Uh, say I think it's a couple of things. I mean, over the last handful of years, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention um, Museums Advocacy Day and our um, summer effort invite Congress to visit your museum. Um, not to, to, to pat AAM on the back, but because I've seen how powerfully they turn museum professionals into advocates, be it first time advocates or experienced advocates, and the stamp that they've made on offices, you know, that maybe had an arts person or an education person, but didn't know until the last 10 years that they were gonna hear from their museum people and their collecting and and um, and and living history sites and children's museum and, um, uh, you know, botanic gardens and all different types of museums every year, year in, year out, and be on the radar and have staff know that they've got, um, that, that, that this community is paying attention. So that's powerful to me. The other work I would mention is the work that, that um, we've been, you know, um, I feel fortunate to do uh, at AAM and that museums, um, more and more museums we've seen across the country do, which is in voter engagement, right? Understanding that um, nonprofit museums are absolutely not just bipartisan, but nonpartisan, but that there's so much we can do um, within the uh, within what's allowed under um, the law and IRS regulations to to help create engaged and effective um, advocates and help in that role of creating an informed um, electorate. So I think that that work is is incredibly um, powerful and near and dear to me. And uh, you know, as much AAM's efforts as seeing what museums are uh, you know doing around the country to um, register voters and share information about the electoral process. We have a question from Alice. Um, what do you think is the best way to experience a historic site? Should a visitor enter a historic site having completed research or go in for fresh set of eyes and learning about the location on site? Oh my goodness. Um, I, think, I think it could be either. I mean, to me, the best museums and the best historic places, again, as I said in my presentation, are the ones that are just active and inclusive in as many ways as possible. Um, and so, you know, as much as I appreciate someone who's really studied up and has a passion for a particular subject or an object or a person whose story might be told at a historic site, there is literally nothing in my professional life that makes me happier than walking into a place like Cooper Malera and seeing um, people carrying around their groceries because they just wandered in from Trader Joe's next door or seeing somebody, um, you know, with their coffee in their hand. There was an image in my, in my presentation of two girls sitting uh, at a table playing chess. And that was precisely why we put the chess set there. But I walked in one day and these two little girls, you know, they were like 14, I guess, teenagers, were playing chess and it was it was almost like everything I wanted to have happen was happening and so I almost didn't know what to say and I said oh my gosh you guys are playing chess here and this girl looked at me and she said yeah there's a chess set we do this every day um, and so to me that was you know that that was it so I I I think you know historic sites and and museums of all kind you know are places that ought to be the kinds of places you can come to as a scholar or you can just wander into and, and find a home, find something that speaks to you. Amber? Uh, so I love this question because it's kind of, um, it's just tickling me to death, honestly, because before my husband and I last traveled our big trip um, abroad, I had less time than usual before that trip to do the kind of pre-research on the sites that we were going to that I do. And at a certain point I said to him and myself, okay, you know what, I'm just gonna embrace it and go in, I'll go into the sites 
uh, clean slate and then I'll do some more research after. So I really agree with Catherine. I, I love that this question takes at its premise that you're going to do both to begin with. And yes. I feel like if that's the case, then that's, um, you know, just the kind of engaged visitors um, and advocates that, 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 you know, we all want to see participating in this field. So I would agree. I think it's, I, I love that the question was asked to begin with, and I don't think there's a right or wrong way. I, I do love the idea of thinking about how you engage with the primary source of a site and then also either continue to engage with it on your own or or how engaging with the primary source fills in that research that you've already done. I think we have time for one more question um, from Annie. Um, wonderful conversation and perspective on communication and advocacy. Are there any projects or organizations that you are incredibly passionate about right now or really inspired by? So I think it's in time to give a platform or height to anyone that you've, you've been eyeing going, okay, everyone needs to know about them. So um, Catherine, who would you want to highlight? Oh my goodness, there are there are too many, but I'll highlight a couple related um, specifically to my presentation. First of all, um, the incredible work of the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund at the National Trust, the largest campaign ever untaken, undertaken on behalf of um, saving and interpreting places related to African American history and culture, just passed its $25 million mark um, and just making a tremendous and important difference in the world. Um, I'll also flag our campaign for where women made history, um, which is again about telling the stories of women's history through place. And then being the good advocate that I am, Ember, I will um, note that there is again a, a campaign underway to, to create a Julius Rosenwald and Rosenwald Schools National Historic Park. Um, and I think there's a link in the chat to that, but um, those are three efforts, at least related to part of my uh, presentation that I think are super, super important um, and urge you to check them out. Amber, who do you want to highlight point to? So this one is hard for me. This is the one that makes me feel like um, A, you know, picking among beloved children um, and be, you know, in these times when everybody has such different range of causes near and dear to them, I want to be, um, I want to leave room for everybody to pick, to pick their own. But I will say, you know, generally speaking, there's so much that I um, follow in um, the youth and youth foster care and youth homelessness um, movement. And um, ad advocacy realm and what's going on. And I have um, for a long time, uh, you know, for example, what um, children in, uh, in the adoption system face and what aging out of adoption looks like, um, particularly in this time of COVID. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, other issues that I follow are uh, social and racial justice and women's health and reproductive issues. For the reason I took this question a little bit beyond our um, sector, but I think that's because, so I would uh, say, you know, as Catherine alluded to, there's so many organizations in our sector doing so much good work. And there's so many organizations beyond the cultural, uh, you know, in addition to the cultural sector, taking on issues that intersect in uh, with the cultural sector in ways we might not realize, right? So I think that um, to me the big thing is is just engaging you know find those causes that that speak to you get on their lists donate when you're able support when you're able do the advocacy activities that they suggest um, because I think that the to some extent even when you feel tired right leaning in actually can re-energize um, and 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 help keep us um, and help give us new ideas for our, our day jobs and our full-time field um, even when we feel tired and that to some extent, inspirations all around in that regard. Uh, thank you so much, both of you. I know I, I tasked you with what can be a, a kind of a daunting kind of you know homework assignment. To I think when you're in the midst of doing the work, how do you stop and think? Okay, so what? Why am I doing this, and how do I do this? Right. So really have the opportunity to kind of share. You know, your passion that brought you to this field, your guiding principles, but also as a reminder, especially Leslie. Um, I'm gonna get to your question, but that's yeah, a really powerful question about how do you maintain your energy and positive attitude when you feel tired, things are not going your way. And so for many of us working in these various fields, you know, especially for the last year and a half, um, you know, what is a way of reminding us of why this work matters, right? Why did you enter these fields in the first place? How have we kind of, um, how has our career developed over time? What has been our inspiration? And how do we translate that passion, that inspiration, not only to our fellow, um, I would say, um, colleagues, but also to the people of the public that we're serving? Because at the end of the day, 
if you don't transfer that passion, that sense of place and identity to these various um, places, then really what what is all the, what's this exercise? So once again, thank you so much um, for joining us today and our attendees. I hope you enjoy the rest of your um, afternoon. I'd love to thank as well the American Women's History Initiative and National Society to, for Colonial Dames of America for providing the space and opportunity to do so. Thank you very much. Thanks, Katrina. Thank you.